Hi, everyone. Welcome. On behalf of the Abraham Lincoln Brigades, I want to thank you so much for being with us today. I am Cristina Perez Jimenez, and I'm an associate professor of English at Manhattan College. I am live from a very rainy um, day in the Bronx, and I'm also a proud member of ALBA. ALBA's mission is to preserve the legacy of volunteers who fought fascism in Spain. If you are joining our events for the first time, please be sure to check out our website for more information. You will find links to our website in the chat, and also be sure to sign up and receive our quarterly publication, The Volunteer. It's great. ALBA is pleased to offer our programs free of charge, but of course, that is only possible through the incredible generosity of our donors. Please do consider making a donation at the links which you can find now in the chat. And now before we begin, a couple of housekeeping matters. This event will be recorded. If you prefer not to be seen, you may turn off your camera. There will be opportunity for questions from the audience. So feel free to start thinking about your questions now. We will soon invite you to put them in the chat. And today, Alba is pleased to present this program in honor of Women's History Month. We will explore the history of the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory fire and also discuss labor struggles today. I would like to thank our three presenters and briefly introduce them now. So first, we have the pleasure of hosting Mary Ann Trusciati. She's a professor of rhetoric and public advocacy and the director of labor studies. She's also president of the Remember the Triangle Fire Coalition. Dr. Trusciati studies working class social movements, social protests, Um, in 2022. Oh, I think uh, maybe Christina there had a poor connection. Um, apologies, everybody. Um, I apologize uh, to Marianne. Sorry, your introduction got a little, cut a little short. Um, you just hold on a minute. I think we can uh, just bear with us for a second. I can complete this. Thank you, everybody, for holding. Hi, can me. you guys hear me now? Uh, yes. I yeah. apologize. I'm live from my office. I'm um, <laughs> not sure what could be the problem. Marianne, I apologize. Um, I was in the midst of introducing me. Can you hear me okay? So, Marianne, I'm going to try to take... Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm happy to introduce myself in the interest of. Uh, just, just, uh, mm -hmm. uh, I can, I can complete it. Hi, uh, can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay. All right. Um, Thanks. Thanks for your patience, everyone. And um, uh, Marianne is a professor of rhetoric and public advocacy uh, and director of labor studies. She is also president of Remember the Triangle Fire Coalition. Uh, Dr. Triscotti studies working class social movements, social protest, public memory, and practices of commemoration. She is completing a book on the civil liberties activism of radical labor organizer Elizabeth Gurley Flynn and is co-editor of two recent anthologies, Talking to Girls, Intimate and Political Essays on the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory Fire, and Where Are the Workers? Labor Stories at Museums and Historical Sites. Since 2010, she has helped organize the annual official Triangle, Triangle Fire Commemoration and has led the project to build the Triangle Fire Memorial 
dedicated in 2023. We also have with us Suzanne Pred Bass. She is the great niece of Rosie Weiner, who died in the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire, and Katie Weiner, who survived. She has served on the executive board of the Remember the Triangle Fire Coalition since its inception in 2008. She spoke as a family representative at both the October 23 Triangle Fire Memorial Dedication Ceremony and the 2011 Triangle Fire Centennial Commemoration and is featured in the HBO documentary, Triangle, Remembering the Fire. She has a private practice as a psychotherapist and was the founder and artistic director of the Todd Mountain Theater Project, which produced new plays for 16 years. She had the privilege of being hired by George Watt to work as a clinician at Maimonides Community Mental Health Center in the 1970s. So, so she has a, an interesting personal connection to one of our vets. And last but not least, we have Abby Harper, who is a neurospicy trauma-informed organizer and activist and graduate student at the CUNY School of Labor and Urban Studies, focusing on cooperative management and workplace democracy. In the spring of 2022, Abby reached out to the Emergency Workplace Organizing Committee, EWOC, for help organizing her coworkers on the National Eating Disorders Association helpline. In the spring of 2023, their union, Helpline Associates United, voted to affiliate with the Communication Workers of America Local 1101 in a landslide election victory. In addition to facilitating EWOC organizer trainings here in New York City, she is a volunteer organizer and advocate for the Workplace Psych Psychological Safety Act. So thank you again for bearing with us. And by the way, I'm Mark Ball. I'm the executive director of ALBA, and I uh, want to thank everyone for being here. And thank you also, Christine. I'm sorry about the tech problems. So without further ado, over, over to you, Marianne, for your, pres for your uh, presentation. Great. Thank you so much. I, I'm absolutely delighted to be here uh, with ALBA. Um, I admire the work that you do and, of course, the heroism of the vets. Um, and I am uh, at Hofstra University, but also remember the Triangle Fire Coalition. And like ALBA, um, we have a mission to preserve historical memory, and in this case, the memory of the 1911 Triangle Shirtwaist Factory Fire, and also to explore and encourage people and organizations to see the contemporary relevance of the fire, because um, sadly, uh, it is uh, still relevant. Um, so I'm, I'm happy that you chose us for Women's History Month. Um, I'm sure the vets knew about the fire. I'm sure many of them uh, worked in the industry, and I think that they're, you know, they they would feel good about this um, this event, and as we do, um, I, what I'd like to do uh, before uh, I talk about the coalition's work is to just give a little brief overview of the fire. I'm sure that most people here, if not everyone, have some general idea, but I think I would be remiss if I didn't kind of sketch out uh, the details. And my longtime comrade Suzanne, um, you can fill in anything that I that I leave out um, or correct anything that I get wrong. Um, so th this is a fire that happened in Greenwich Village in New York City, right? N uh, and, and not too far from, from the ABBA office, in fact, um, at a time when New York was a center for clothing manufacturer uh, in the world. When I talk about that with my students, they're surprised because they don't, I, few of them, if any, uh, own clothing made in the U.S., but but in fact, uh, women's clothing in particular was, was um, very much a product of American industry. Um, and it was an industry that the owners of Triangle uh, excelled at. They made shirtwaists, which are basically um, crisp um, blouses, uh, you know, cotton popularized by the Gibson girl. And they were known as the shirtwaist kings because they were so good at it. Um, and Dennis, if you could just put up the, the first slide just as, as background. Um, and they had a factory uh, on the corner of Washington uh, Place and Green Street in Greenwich Village. And that uh, the logo of Remember the Triangle Fire Coalition, uh, that is the top of the factory. It's a neo-Renaissance building. It is now landmarked. Um, and their factory is on the 8th, 9th, and 10th floors of that building. And at just before closing time on uh, March 25th, 1911, if you could go to the next slide, Dennis, at about 4.40 p.m., a fire broke out on the 8th floor of that building. It was almost certainly caused by ashes from a cutter's cigarette that fell into a bin. 
of scraps um, and that bin uh, burst into flames. And there was so much, uh, so many fibers in the air that the air itself burnt into flames. And the, the factory was crowded with uh, workers, many of them women. We don't know exactly how many because the records burned in the fire, uh, but they were tightly packed because uh, when the building was um, you know, dedicated, so it had, uh, so to speak, it had, um, the square footage had been calculated based on the height. It's a loft building rather than the width of the, the floor space. So the factory owners could could uh, jam more people and more machinery into the building. It was fireproof. It was a state of the art building, um, but uh, there were minimal safety measures uh, they, because there were minimal requirements by the city at that time and little to no uh, enforcement. And also uh, there was no union at Triangle. And two years before the fire, there was uh, a general strike of shirtwaist makers, which you may have heard of. The uprising of the 20,000 involved primarily um, Jewish uh, garment workers, um, you know, shirtwaist makers. And it was actually uh, inspired by uh, an incident at the Triangle factory. And it, it ended in success. Um, for many workers at many factories, but not for the workers at Triangle. Um, and so the workers were um, not represented by a union. There was no collective, there was no organization that was fighting for their collective rights as workers, and there were minimal uh, fire codes. And they were, in fact, uh, locked uh, in the factory, we know um, from the testimony at the trial, in part um, to keep out union union organizers. And um, when the fire broke out, as fires do, it went from the eighth floor up uh, to the ninth floor and then the 10th floor, uh, the eighth floor workers, uh, that's where the switchboard was. They called up to the 10th floor to notify workers and the owners and their families on the 10th floor that there was a fire. Eighth floor workers largely escaped. 10th floor workers uh, were uh, went up to the roof. Many of them were ferried across um, to an adjacent building that was an NYU law uh, building. So NYU is an integral part of the story and actually uh, still, still is. Um, but the workers on the ninth floor, um, it was three minutes too late for them. By the time they realized what was happening, um, they many of them uh, were trapped. And uh, they panicked because this was uh, not, nothing that they had ever experienced had prepared them for this. And of course, um, they rushed to the doors, uh, but the doors opened inward. And you can imagine, I'm always struck by this. Fire is terrifying and you're rushing to the door and then you have to step back towards that which frightens you um, because the doors open outward. Um, and there was one exit that they were able to um, get out of, but there was a barrel of oil uh, near that uh, door and it and it burst into flames, closed that exit off. There was another exit, but that was locked. That was uh, um, the exit that um, was not available to them. And that the the whole trial hinged on whether or not the owners knew that that, that door was locked. Um, there was an elevator. Uh, I believe there was more than one elevator. And the you had uh, workers who grabbed onto the cables to come down and others who jammed themselves into the elevator. And one of the heroes of this story is actually an elevator operator, an Italian immigrant named Josito, who could have taken girls down and left um, to save his own life. And I don't think any one of us would have blamed him, but he didn't. He kept going up um, until the elevator became uh, inoperative. Um, so the workers were uh, trapped inside, uh, those who could not escape. They, we know from survivors' accounts, many of them tried to find family members um, because there were uh, several uh, family members who worked at Triangle. I believe there were seven pairs of sisters, mother-son, uh, mother-daughters. Um, and so, of course, people would would struggle to find their loved ones. Um, and and uh, so they were clearly um, in, a, in a terrible situation uh, inside um, and and outside uh, the FDNY rushed to the scene as soon as they got the call um, and attempted to um, to obviously to help. Uh, but um, they were unable to do so. So while people gathered at the corner and looked on in horror, um, at firefighters uh, themselves looking on in horror because they were rendered helpless. Their ladders only went up to the sixth floor and they just could not get uh, put the fire out with um, the uh, technology, the, the water and the technology that was available. Um, so in the end, um, workers, uh, hopeful, I imagine, but also desperate, jumped uh, from the ninth floor windows. At, at least 60 of them jumped. Um, 146 in total died. Um, the workers who jumped initially, uh, some of them, uh, there was an effort to catch them in nets and those broke through. The force of gravity was too much. Um, and so it was a really horrific 
horrific, terrible sight. Um, and and uh, many, many people witnessed it and were forever changed by it. Um, most of the workers who died, indeed most of the workers at Triangle were immigrants. Uh, two thirds of the 146 who died more or less were Jewish and a third uh, were Italian. Um, the youngest were 14 years old. The oldest, I believe, was 43, and 129 of them were women and teenage girls, and their bodies were brought to a makeshift morgue on 26th Street for identification. Um, and if memory serves, there was uh, th there was a call actually put out for coffins um, because they just could not get enough. The, the death toll was just so staggering uh, in that moment. And the city in the aftermath of this was engulfed by grief. People cried out that night in front of the building. They held multiple funeral processions. Um, but that grief uh, soon became mixed with anger. On April 2nd, 1911, there was a meeting at the Metropolitan Opera House at which the young um, diminutive but mighty labor organizer Rose Schneiderman spoke and she castigated uh, the elites of New York City um, for knowing that this was going on and, and uh, basically not caring and uh, made the claim, I think rightfully so, that the best way to remember the fire, the best memorial would be a strong working class movement. Um, on April 5th, 1911, the city buried what was then believed to be seven unidentified um, workers who had died at Triangle, and they opted to bury them at the Evergreen Cemetery in Brooklyn. And um, they took charge of this procession. In part, uh, they did. They feared the hysteria of the women survivors. They did not want to go near the building, and they did not want to encourage that kind of feminine uh, uh, emotion. Um, and so um, the the or the women and the organizers, the labor organizers um, among the survivors decided that they would organize their own uh, funeral procession. Uh, on the same day, uh, they combined Italian and Jewish mourning customs and um, brought hearses, horse-drawn hearses through, uh, the, through the lower part of the city, um, meeting converging from several points. A uh, hundred thousand of them marched. It was pouring rain and they marched silently in the rain with no umbrellas and no banners except for ones that said we mourn our loss and there were as many as 300,000 witnesses that day for the silent procession. Um, these workers wanted justice but that was denied to them. On April 11th a grand jury indicted Blank and Harris and charged them with second degree manslaughter and they were acquitted because the members of the jury uh, did not uh, did not feel convinced beyond the shadow of a doubt that they knew that the doors had been locked because of the contract system much like in the really kind of convoluted supply chain today that we can look away and say, well, we didn't know when garment factories uh, have terrible tragedies around the world. Blank and Harris were protected by the contract system in the early 20th century. They didn't, they didn't get their hands dirty in the day-to-day -day operations of the factory, so they could say they didn't know. Um, civil suits were filed, however, against the two. And on March uh, 1914, they, so three years later, they were ordered to pay $75 per life lost in the fire. And uh, in the end, we know that they actually made money on this event because their insurance paid them more than they paid the families. And and I'll let Suzanne talk about the family's reaction to some of these things um, because she is, uh, I think, a very eloquent uh, spokesperson for that. Um, if you could go to the next slide, please. So U.S. labor history, and I know we have some labor histories in here, uh, historians, some of whose work I've read and admired very much, you, you know, and, and pretty much everybody who, who has anything to do with U.S. labor history, there are a lot of really awful stories, terrible things happen, strikes, lost people killed on the job, you know, police and Pinkertons beating up workers. Um, but, but Triangle seems to be among the most sticky of those stories. It has kind of seeped into our consciousness. And um, you know, people often ask why? Why do why do I why do I think that has happened? I don't know that I'm I'm maybe too close to it to have a good sense, but I do have some ideas. First, because the building where it happened still stands, and here it is today. It's an NYU classroom. Uh, it's a science building. I think genetics labs are on the top, um, and it's in Greenwich Village. It's in a neighborhood that people go to, that people you know want to be in. So I think that there are some very literally concrete reasons, right, where it is and what it is um, uh, that that make it kind of a sticky. Um, but also I think because these were women and young women uh, and and rat not radical young women. Um, they weren't anarchists. They weren't socialists. They, they, there was no CP yet, but they weren't communists. Like we don't have to explain away their politics. They were innocents who went to work one day and never came home. And you know, in the larger culture of the United States, 
um, not being uh, associated with any kind of radical politics. I mean, Clara Lemlich joined the CP, right? And we, that we don't really ever even talk about that. We always talk about the very young Clara Lemlich um, uh, before, right? She joined the party. So I think that that helps. Um, um, but also, um, I think because this fire was a catalyst for change, um, because it couldn't be ignored, because the what was inside the factory quite literally and tragically spilled out onto the streets of New York, people couldn't pretend that things like this weren't happening all around them. People saw, people smelled, people heard, and people were changed. Um, the experience of seeing this fire, let alone living through it, moved people in ways that they found to be very, very profound and very lifelong. Women workers um, were among, it's particularly immigrant women, the, the group that I tend to know better is Italians. Um, they were moved by this. Um, it made joining a union seem a more, much more palatable idea than it had before. Italians in particular were suspicious of unions and a lot of reasons for that. And they started becoming more militant and organizing because they saw that like, well, they really need an organization to represent their interests. The ILGWU, um, Clara Lemlick and others uh, really uh, organized Local 23, Local 25 into a powerhouse of that union and certainly the momentum of Triangle helped. Suffragists pointed to the Brown Building metaphorically and literally sometimes and said, this is what happens when we women don't have a say in the politicians who make the laws that govern us. Um, and po those politicians themselves and other government workers um, were moved by this tragedy to commit themselves to preventing another one. The Factory Investigating Commission established uh, and chaired by Robert Wagner and Al Smith is uh, one example of that. Frances Perkins, who witnessed the fire, she was a young social worker having tea in Washington Square Park. She recalls being forever changed by it. Um, and she was uh, one of those investigators, went around the state looking at how, what kinds of conditions uh, men, women, and children were working in, and was part of that report. Her recommendations were part of that uh, report to the state that led to landmark legislation uh, for sanitary and safety regulations and to begin the process of um, making child exploitative child labor law, uh, child labor illegal. And Perkins also said on the 50th anniversary of the fire that the New Deal began on March 25th, 1911. So we can actually credit federal policies um, like the National Labor Relations Act, unemployment insurance, um, social security, um, <laughs> the, the law uh, eradicating uh, child labor. Uh, we can even trace the lineage of that back to the Triangle Fire, in addition to things like you know, doors that open inward and um, uh, fire extinguishers and better building codes and better safety um, regulations from the FDNY. Um, and and the interesting thing, I did some research on commemorating the Triangle Fire, um, but for the first um, 50 years, the fire was remembered um, in various ways, some of which are might be surprising to you, they were surprising to me, and, and some of them were sporadic. So in 1912, there really wasn't anything. In 1913, ILGWU workers remembered at their meetings. In 1914, there was a citywide fire drill for Triangle Fire Day. Um, in, in all of the boroughs. Um, in the 1930s and 40s, commemoration was uh, sporadic. It might happen on the day of the fire, it might not. It typically involved a, uh, a trip to the Evergreen Cemetery. Um, workers uh, had their own way of commemorating on May Day. They would march for years after the fire. They would march past the building and whatever celebrating they were doing while pr um, processing, they would quiet down when they went past um, the Brown Building. It was originally called the Ash Building, um, but it was donated to NYU after it was refurbished in the early 1920s. Um, and it had it was uh, Mr. Brown who made the donation. So it's now called um, the Brown Building. And interest, perhaps most interestingly enough, in 1951, the Triangle Commemoration happened on May 20th. And you might say, why the heck would that, would a March 25th event be commemorated on May 20th? Well. It was commemorated um, by the union, the ILGWU, as part of I Am an American Day. And I Am an American Day was um, in the in in the 1950s, uh, it was a way to um, emphasize uh, American citizenship as a laudable goal and to um, encourage uh, immigrants to um, 
to uh, be loyal to the U.S. and not to the arch rival uh, Soviet Union. Essentially, it was part of the Cold War. Um, so alas, uh, the Triangle Commemoration in 1951 um, was uh, an anti part of uh, anti-communist uh, propaganda. And also the, the May date for I Am an American Day was meant to kind of take some of the wind out of the sails of May Day. Um, and it was then moved to September, um, but up until 1952, it was in May in part to, to dilute uh, the impact of May Day. If you could go to the next slide. Um, in 1961, uh, there was a, a, a large uh, commemoration of the fire for the 50th anniversary. And you can see that here it was at the, uh, in, at the site, uh, at the corner of Washington and Green. Um, and it was a woman, uh, again, uh, who thought that this was something that should be done. Esther Peterson, a sec assistant secretary of labor for JFK and the head of the women's division, uh, wrote to uh, David Dubinsky and said, you know, the, the 50th anniversary of the Triangle Fire is coming up. It would be great if there were some kind of significant uh, commemoration. Dubinsky wrote to Leon Stein, the editor of Justice and the author of the first book about the fire, which was coincided to appear around the 50th anniversary. Um, and Stein said, I'm on it. Although, as far as I can tell from, from what I've seen, he wasn't on it, um, but he thought it was a good idea and he got on it. Um, and so the union and, um, you know, politicians and, and other uh, organizations um, made a big deal. And you can see, if you look, uh, you can see the fire ladder here uh, going up, I assume, to the sixth floor to symbolize the distance between where the ladder could reach um, the highest point it was required to reach by law and where the girls needed help up at the ninth floor. Um, and you can see the, the staging here and the crowd. Um, and uh, we know that Eleanor Roosevelt was there, Francis Perkins, Rose Schneiderman, and David Dubinsky. Um, in 1975, there was another significant uh, commemoration led by the ILGWU. Um, and then um, in 19, <clears throat> sorry, 19, I'm sorry, in 2011, we had the centennial of the fire, and that uh, was uh, uh, another um, big deal. Um, if you could, uh, Dennis, go to. So um, remember, the Triangle Fire Coalition was founded to do uh, to bring the story of the fire to people and to uh, demonstrate its continued relevance. And we we just embraced two ways to do that, and uh, many ways, but two major goals. One was um, to really elevate the the. The, the centennial to um, the kind of commemoration that we thought the event deserved. And um, and we did do that. We acted as a node in a network that was, you know, citywide, statewide, national, and even um, in some cases, international, um, connecting individuals and organizations. You can see the poster that we created on the on the left. And then on the right, you can see that one of the, the important things that we wanted to do with the commemoration was to show that that Triangle is something from the past, but it's also from the present. Um, it's history, but it's it's also a current events. It is very American, but it is it involves immigrants and it involves uh, labor uh, working people and labor organizers around the world, as it as it always had, right? Because ba even back in 1911, this was an event that that affected uh, people around the world. So you see at the top, Calpona actor sharing that little bubble uh, with Clara Lemlich. All right, Lemlick, whose fa famous quote when she launched the uprising of the 20,000, I've got something to say so that they could actually uh, allow her to speak. Um, so Cla Calpona Actor was there and um, uh, and continues to be a supporter of our work as we are of hers and to illustrate the global relevance uh, really of this, of this fire. Um, so uh, what did we do at the commemoration? If you could, um, Dennis, if you could show. Um, so uh, a few of these, th these the shirtwaist that you see in front of you, these have become iconic symbols of the of triangle commemorations. And they were the brainchild of uh, one of our board members, Lulu Lolo. Yes, uh, oh, sorry, I'll, we'll address that later. Lulu Lolo and Annie Lanzalotto. And essentially they are, you know, uh, shirt cutouts on poles, each of which has a sash that bears the name and age of someone who died in the fire. So they are symbolic, but they are also very particular. Um, each of the workers who died has a name and an age. They are not just an abstraction. We felt very strongly about that. And they they float like the spirits of the ancestors and like those banners um, that, that said back in 1911, we mourn our loss, the labor banners, the Hebrew trades, um, the Hebrew burial society banners. Uh, and etc. And I, I'm I'm very happy to say that the, the young girl on the right is my daughter, um, who was carrying Anna Altman, and who has come to many 
commemorations. And Dennis, if you could. So we had a major procession of shirtwaists from Union Square. Then we gathered at the building as they did um, in 1961 and many years after that. Uh, we uh, the FDNY raised the ladder. If you've never come to a commemoration, this is the most powerful thing. It never gets old. When you see that gap, your heart is in your chest. Um, Dennis, if you could. Um, and then if you could go to the next slide, we uh, said the names and you could see children here uh, and the FDNY uh, uniformed officer rang the bell and we left the flowers there. After the centennial, uh, we committed ourselves or recommitted ourselves to so the second project was to build a triangle uh, memorial. Uh, we want something there when there are no shirtways flying, when there are no flowers in the streets, when the fire engine is gone. And um, I've asked myself several times at the beginning of this project and indeed throughout, why? Why do we need a memorial? Why do, why, why do this? Um, a hundred years later, there are lots of things going on now, Marianne, that you could be focusing on your time your time on. And, I, and there are several reasons why, and I just want to share them to you before I briefly show you the memorial. The Triangle story, I think, demonstrates the contributions of working class immigrants and women to the building of and to the to our society generally and to the building literally and figuratively of our city, our state, our nation and, and our world. It reminds us that people should never come before profits. And around the globe, that is still happening. Triangle keeps happening. Tazreen in Bangladesh in 2012, there was a horrific fire. Rana Plaza collapsed in 2013. During COVID, we saw workers dying on the job. But even now, the bridge uh, in Baltimore, right? Working uh, workers dying on the job. And we see a lack of enforcement, OSHA, uh, investigators are few in number. We also ch see child labor making a comeback. All right, there's children work working at a Cheetos factory in Michigan at a meat plant in Alabama. And lawmakers in several states are pushing to have laws that regulate this practice, which should not exist, um, loosened or repealed. And then um, finally, uh, not finally, but also Triangle inspires community. There's power in sharing a story as all of you at Alba know. Um, and this Triangle story has been shared quite a bit um, and, and it brings people together. It also demonstrates the power of organizing and collective action. We live in a very individualistic society in a very individualistic moment. And Triangle shows that people can come together and make good things happen when they commit themselves to doing that. And finally, I think the story illustrates how government can be a force for good and a source of freedom. A government can be the source of laws that protect me and you and everyone else and free us from the travails of today, the dangers of today to enjoy another day. So our memorial clearly has work to do, Dennis, if you could if you could show it. Um, here it is. Um, you see the fire on the left. You see in the middle um, uh, the image of the memorial. It's a stainless steel ribbon that drops down from the ninth floor where most of the workers died and splits 12 feet above the building. And in this split, as you can see on this side, right, on the right is what you would see. It's a rendering of what you would see if you were standing at the corner of Washington and Green above, below those plaques that are lovely, uh, but that really um, people don't see. Um, and you see these names stenciled in. So here we have the names and ages of all the workers who died. And then on this side, the story is told in English. And on the, the Green Street side, the story is told in Yiddish and Italian to honor the immigrant heritage of the workers. And then down here at about waist height, these stenciled names, which you see you can't really read up there, are reflected on a beautiful panel, um, along with uh, some very poignant quotes. If you could just, um, uh, Dennis. Uh, so this is what the steel looks like. And down here is the reflective panel. And this is the Green Street. Uh, no, this is the Washington Place side, I believe. And then, um, Dennis, if you could go to the next, the next slide. And here we go. These are the names reflected. And here is eyewitness testimony from the workers, all of whom are named and their jobs are listed, as well as William Gunn Shepherd, the AP reporter, who uh, phoned in that really powerful eyewitness account that reverberated in newspaper accounts around the country, and Francis Perkins. Um, and the memorial was dedicated, um, if you would uh, go to the next slide. It cost us approximately $3 million. We raised that from the state of New York and labor unions and some foundations like the ILGW Heritage Fund, the American Society for Safety Professionals, the Hillman Foundation, the Puffin Foundation, um, and individuals, um, but mostly the state and labor unions, including um, Workers United, which is the, the, uh, the current day incarnation of the ILGWU. 
It was a really lovely ceremony. If you could um, keep going, I'm wrapping up here. Um, and you can see people coming up. Um, the flowers are no longer left on the ground after we say the names. Um, they are now uh, put on the memorial. Um, and uh, so you can see right here, this is Surf Maltese, the gentleman in the wheelchair who lost his grandmother and two aunts uh, in the fire. In effect, all of the women in his family were um, eradicated uh, that day. You could go to the next slide. Here is uh, what it looks like um, to see the names uh, with uh, the reflection. And finally, if you could, um, if you could just, uh, there's one more that I would like to show. And this is Calpona Actor. And I think this is terrific. Calpona came to New York and she's got a lot of demands on her time, but she made sure that she came down to the memorial and stood there and felt communion with the workers at Triangle and recommitted herself as she does pretty much every day of her life to the struggle and to the memory of Clara Limlick and the 146 who worked at Triangle. Um, so I'll, I will, um, our, the memorial is not quite finished though. That ribbon that goes up the side that you saw in the rendering, it, it'll be installed in the summer, but it's doing its work, right? People in the neighborhood come, students, workers, union organizers, Calpona actor, and everyone should visit. And all of you at this meeting, please come because the threats against the good things that this tragedy inspired, like the NLRB, social security prohibitions against uh, child, uh, workers, the exploitation of child workers, make this memorial more important than ever. Like they did 100 years ago, government leaders and ordinary people have the power to fight back against these threats. Judging by the rise in worker militancy, the fight is on. Our dream is for this memorial to inspire everyone who sees it to join that fight and to stay with it until we build the world that we want and we deserve. Thank you. I'm Sue. passing it to Suzanne now, but Suzanne, you're muted. Hi. Uh, thank you, Marianne, for that uh, powerful, comprehensive uh, overview of uh, the Triangle Fire and, and what it spawned. Uh, as you know, my name is Suzanne Pred-Bass and I am a longtime member of uh, the, remember the Triangle Fire Coalition. In some ways, getting this memorial built, uh, I would say has been a, a very important part of my life's work. And I just wanna say that Marianne was the president and spearheaded this and that it, it took a small band, relatively small band of passionate uh, labor activists uh, led by Marianne, uh, 13 years to raise the money uh, to get this memorial built. It, it's a saga that really needs to be uh, known. So I hope somebody gets the book out there someday. And I do, you, it, it's a stunning memorial. Uh, it will be completed, we hope, by the summer, but, you know, delays keep occurring. And uh, really, uh, I can assure you, if you go down there, you will be moved and inspired. Uh, I had two great aunts in the fire. And uh, as I have said, uh, I think to Mark and, and Dennis earlier, I'm keenly aware that um, I am one of the few dwindling uh, number of people who actually got to talk to somebody who was in the fire. So my two great aunts, Rosie Wiener, who with great uh, controversy and uh, not dead certainty, I have determined that her age is was 23. She died in the fire. Um, she was locked behind the closed door, couldn't get out. Uh, I do believe that she delayed uh, the possibility of maybe getting on an elevator and getting out because she was looking for Katie. If she was the older sister, I think she felt responsible for her. This is, this is how I have cobbled the story together, but it makes a lot of sense to me. Uh, Katie 
was 17 when she testified at the trial. My mother told me she was 16 at the time of the fire. Uh, with the extraordinary pluck and courage of a teenager and also desperately realized after running to the window, running to the door, not being able to find a way out, that the elevator was her only hope. And uh, as the last elevator came up, she ran to the elevator and was unable to get in because there were too many people in the door. And she jumped on to the cable as the elevator was going down. When my grandson heard the story, he said, Katie was a ninja, you know. Um, she was extraordinary and she did survive um, the fire. And I had the great fortune to get to know her. But here's the thing, nobody in my family talked about the fire. You know, the brutality, the trauma, the shock uh, stops people who have experienced it in their tracks, in their lives. And then it's a struggle to go forward. It's a struggle to uh, not be buried in the tragedy. And I recognize that uh, very strongly in my mother's uh, sadness and in my grandmother's sadness. My grandmother Minnie was uh, of course the sister of Rosie and Katie. Uh, so I never heard about Rosie. Her name was never mentioned. And when I was old enough, uh, I knew Katie. I would go to her house as a child. She married a union president, Phil Lubliner. And uh, she was a very colorful, vivacious, uh, you know, sort of a wonderful person to be around. And uh, she adored my mother and my mother adored her. So they had a long relationship. And in her final years, when Katie moved to Miami from Brooklyn, uh, she would stay with my parents uh, in what was then the ILGWU houses that uh, run from 23rd to 28th Street on 8th Avenue, now known as Penn South, uh, for union members. Uh, my dad was a teacher and he was in, in the U UFT. Uh, but uh, what I did glean, and this is important to know, uh, very early on, uh, I'll just shoot back for a second. What I wanted to tell you was I did ask Katie about the fire and she did recount for me how she got out. But again, Rosie was never mentioned. I found out about Rosie through my own research, through my own reading. That's, that's how the information came to me. And I do think the pain is so extreme, the trauma so extraordinary, uh, the pain so great that uh, these stories cannot be talked about. And it's felt that you don't want children to know about them because they are so horrific. Uh, I do think maybe I had heard something. my mother and uh, grandmother lived around the corner from us and they spoke. spoke Yiddish and maybe I understood. And the It was afraid of ghosts or monsters. Yeah. yeah. So, oh, but I was my childhood. Suzanne, what I did, and, and this is so important, be not get the story. Um, Suzanne, we have a little bit of a bandwidth issue. Um, kind of coming in and of out. the tragedy. You can hear me. Can you hear me? Just going in and out. Okay. Now, um, just going in and out. Okay. I, I, I'm going to wrap up soon. I just want to say that, you know, you may not get the story, but what I learned 
probably, you know, shortly after I learned to walk was that workers' rights need to be protected. They need to be fought for. I learned that a scab was like the lowest uh, rung of humanity. You did not cross a union picket line and you stood up where you saw, saw injustice. That was the message that was given to me. And I think that is, and to my brothers, and we were, have all been activists throughout our lives. Uh, and I am really grateful for that message, though I wasn't given the story of Rosie. I was imparted with a mission. And, uh, you know, that for that I have uh, enormous gratitude. So I will now turn this over to Abby Harper. Thank you, thank you. so much, Suzanne. That was incredible. And thank you, Marianne, as well. Um, I'm so honored to be here with both of you today um, talking about what's going on in labor right now, specifically um, with the Emergency Workplace Organizing uh, Committee, which is uh, an organizing group uh, that was created by the Democratic Socialists of America and United Electrical Workers Union um, as a response to COVID and the exploitation of front, um, frontline workers. Um, excuse me. So um, kind of coming together with what's been said today, you know, this idea that we are living right now through a normalized kind of collective crisis together and how important it is to talk about the collective trauma that we're experiencing from COVID, from racial violence, from seeing war um, happening in Palestine and in the Ukraine right now. It's really very devastating, um, a devastating time to be a human with a heart. Um, so uh, I just want to talk a little bit about some um, hopeful uh, things that I'm, I'm noticing in the movement. So Dennis, may I have my slides, please? Okay, so um, my name's Abby Harper, as um, we've already established. And uh, this is me when my union went kind of viral in the news uh, when our boss union busted us with an AI chat bot that immediately gave weight loss and diet tips to folks with eating disorders. Um, so, you know, it's interesting to note that um, my organizing campaign with my coworkers, which um, mentioned a little while ago, was on the National Eating Disorders Association helpline, uh, was that we did not ask for more money we wanted inclusion, we wanted psychological safety, we wanted uh, training, you know, we, we wanted dignity and respect is really kind of what it boils down to. And uh, that's something uh, we see with care workers a lot of the time, uh, the normalized kind of um, exploitation of these people. And that's something we saw with essential workers um, during COVID, um, you know, something like Marianne was saying, a highly visible kind of um, example of, of exploitation that was pretty hard to turn your head away from. Um, could we go to the next slide, please, Dennis? So a brief history of EWOC. We're still pretty uh, relatively new organization. Um, I was saying earlier that it began in 2020, in March of 2020, um, as a project to reach out to new workplaces that didn't have um, a union at them. Um, I believe it was the, there was a 2017 study that came out that said like half of non-unionized workers would want to be in a union if they could vote. So there's a huge number of people that are interested in this movement. And unfortunately, there are a huge number of people that are interested because of how necessary it is because we're having to fight for things like our safety and fight against wage theft and, you know, fight, I mean, at will employment is something that we're trying to fight right now in New York City. Like the 
there's a lot stacked against um, the working people in New York and across uh, the world in the United States due to um, capitalism, as we all know. So Ewok comes around and um, by 2022, over 3,000 workers had reached out um, for support and Ewok um, was able to sign a volunteer um, organizer to 60 campaigns that won demands at their workplaces, which is amazing. Um, something Ewok does is training and worker education, um, not teaching you like, this is what a union is, although that's very important, but also how do you think like an organizer? How do we find, um, you know, these opportunities to catalyze change in these terrible um, crises? Uh, so by 2023, Ewok was actively involved in supporting 186 campaigns across the United States. I'm happy to say there were 17 marches on the boss two strikes and a total of 447 collective actions taken at workplaces. And these are generally um, non-union um, affiliated workplaces, uh, something that Ewok believes very strongly is that while affiliating with the union and having a contract is amazing, the union is about solidarity with your coworkers and demanding dignity, respect and the living wage. Uh, so that is, oops, I forgot to fill in uh, what we're doing, to, what we're going to today because it's on the next slide. Um, so can we go to the next slide, that is. Uh, so today, um, EWOC, there are a lot of active campaigns across the United States, but in New York City, we've had some really exciting wins in the past year or even honestly in the past month. Um, so uh, like I was saying, workers that generally aren't organized by unions or in sectors that are organized by unions, like a game board um, or a board game cafe rather, uh, was organized with Ewok. It's called Hex and Co. They affiliated with Workers United and have now inspired multiple board game cafes, including one in Chicago to organize, which is really, really exciting. Another big win was at Barbancino, which is a pizzeria in Brooklyn. They became the first unionized pizzeria in New York City, which is a super big deal. And what's really cool is you really start to see this community um, mutual aid aspect coming through. You know, after a lot of the folks that organized Barbancino won, they wanted to kind of pay it forward and help other workers, um, which... They recently, um, some Barbancino workers organized for Nighthawk uh, Cinema in Brooklyn and won. Um, they won their vote maybe like two or three weeks ago. So um, it's really um, more than teaching someone, you know, the basics of organizing and what you deserve in a workplace. It really goes much more to this, this return to community and a return to really caring about each other and investing in each other, um, which um, Ewok is doing throughout this year. We're, we're involved in a variety of different campaigns uh, at Starbucks, at Trader Joe's, Amazon, Chipotle, um, and then a lot of really exciting movement in the tech sector and the nonprofit world, uh, the nonprofit industrial complex, as they say, and in the healthcare industry. So Lots of really, really exciting organizing going on that's really um very intersectional. And you and you're starting to see like this community solidarity of people showing up for each other. Like, for example, Ewok supported the Teamsters last summer when uh, they had all these great big practice pickets uh, when they were threatening to strike. So Solidarity is our greatest tool for change, and you do start to feel it, certainly in New York City, and um, as necessary as it is, it's also extremely um, hopeful and exciting. Uh, so could we go to the last uh, slide, please, Dennis? So uh, if you want to reach out to Ewok, 
You should. Uh, we are always looking for volunteers. Uh, I'm in charge of New York City in-person trainings. Uh, so if anyone is in New York City and is interested, please, please reach out. It's a wonderful organization. It's really fun to connect with this new wave of people who are really justice um, centered and um, solidarity minded. Uh, you can also sign up for organizing support uh, within 48 hours. If you fill out the EWOC form, an organizer will reach out to you and see how we can help. Um, and then also I put our newsletter sign up in there um, mainly because coming up in June, we're going to have a uh, for, so we do a four part online um, because it started in COVID, right? So usually our trainings occur online. Uh, it's a four week uh, foundational training series. We're going to offer it over the course of two Saturdays in June, the 8th and the 15th at the People's Forum, which is uh, in Midtown Manhattan. Uh, so please like stay tuned on that. Uh, we'd love to see any of you there. It's a really really lovely environment and we will have pizza which um is you know pizza and organizing pretty amazing um there's our website down there workerorganizing.com um and then oh yes i have one last slide um just a little uh original artwork from our union campaign um those are my co-workers cats saying an injury to one is an injury to all um, so thank you all so, so much, and uh, look forward to the uh, Q&A and hearing uh, questions and talking about all this a little bit. Thank you so much, Abby. Uh, yeah, it was great. Um, and just as a note, everybody who signed up for the event will receive a evaluation email with a link to the recording of this session, which will be on Alba's YouTube page. And we can also include some links to EWOC in their schedule, as well as the um, Remember the Triangle Fire Coalition. So you can explore past this event, history and today to your heart's content. OK, great. So again, thank you, everybody, uh, for joining us. Um, thank you. And for those that put their questions in the chat, uh, I've been, I have been my name is Dennis Meany. I'm the executive assistant here at Alba. I've been recording them. So uh, we're at the Q&A portion now. So usually how this goes is I have selected some of your questions to, you know, to whittle them down to allow for time and the subject area. So um, I I will call if you I'm going to select someone. I will call on you. You can ask the panel your question uh, that you put in the chat. Uh, if you don't feel comfortable doing that, that's fine, too. And then I will simply ask your question in the chat. So, uh, yeah, let's get going with our first question then. Um, I believe um, Laura Stevens asked a question that was partially answered in the chat about the the working and the cultural makeup of the Triangle Fire um workers. So Laura, if you'd like to ask your question to the panel now, you can absolutely do so. Yeah. Oh, there we go. Laura, do we got gotcha. you? Okay. Um, oh, that's all right. Um, little hiccup there. Okay. Um, the question was, um, uh, I, I posed this to Marianne and Suzanne. Um, Laura noted that the uh, not March twenty fifth, nineteen eleven, was a Saturday. The workers were working through Shabbat. Um, is there any uh, it, fighting for religious rights in the workplace? Is there anything you'd like to add on that, Marianne to Suzanne, and also to Abby, of course. Um. No, I mean, I think that, you know, profit is profit, right? And so you keep the factory open on Saturday because you there's money to be made. And workers were told, you know, if you don't want to come in, then don't come back. Um, so, you know, people violated the, the Sabbath because they had no choice. And people demanded those violations because there was money to be made. I mean, it's it's that simple. In my own, you know, my own background, Italian in, in, Italians regularly exploited other Italians. Uh, there was no sense that oh, we can't do this to them because 
you know, they're Italian and we're Italian. And, and that was also the case at, at Triangle um, with, with Shabbat, right? Um, I don't know if Suzanne wants to add, I'm not Jewish, but that's, I mean, that's pretty much it. There's, you know, there's money to be made and they're going to make it. Well, I, absolutely. Uh, you know, this just speaks to the greed of the owners, uh, Max Blank and Isaac Harris. Uh, nothing would stop their desire to make money. And yes, you would lose your job. Were all of those Jews at the factory practicing and religious? No. Uh, I know that for a fact, but many of them were and had to sacrifice uh, that day, which was a day of rest, Shabbat, in order to maintain, uh, you know, uh, uh, income for these poor immigrant families. And this is about the greed of the owners and speaks to everything else that went wrong in that factory uh, that they could have done to make sure that that fire did not happen. Great. Great, thank you, Suzanne and Marianne. Um, okay. Um, we're going to go to, this is more of a, a question, I believe, probably for Abby, um, Linda, JG, you may go ahead and ask your question now. Hi. Um, actually, it's a double question. The first question is, uh, yes, it is. It's, it's if um, EWOC works with unions in the organizing um, because Abby didn't mention that. And also if you're only in New York or if you also um, are organizing in other places, especially in non-union states, for example, where it's a lot more difficult and so many um, industries have moved there precisely for that reason. Thank you, um, Linda. So yes, Ewok is not just in New York, it's nationwide. Um, it's a lot of it takes place remotely, um, which is kind of cool. And also like a lot of jobs are remote now. Um, so uh, it doesn't seem so strange. So also we're able to scale on a nationwide level, which is really excellent. And to answer part two, Yes, um, Ewok is extremely active in um, less friendly, um, more conservative um, states with the kind of, um, uh, not your liberal New York City um, welcome mat as, as we kind of get sometimes uh, for unions. Um, and Ewok works with unions, um, kind of as is correct for the shop that's organizing. Um, I've seen like people like Workers United, CWA, UAW, uh, all kinds of these um, unions are kind of coming together into the new organizing movement too. Um, so um, it's really exciting and hopefully that answered everything. That was great. Thank you, Abby, for for enlightening us with that. Um, okay, I think we um we'll go back to a triangle question. Um Jeff uh Jeff Opera Addict had a question on sort of the triangle building and other um businesses that were involved in the fire. Jeff, would you like to ask your question? Hmm. Oh, okay. I'll just ask the question. Jeff is is Mike is having an issue. Um, the question was uh, whether on the ground floor of the Triangle Building were there um, presumably there are other businesses would um, was who, who else was damaged in the fire besides the you know the workers at the factory? What was the larger um, scene of the fire and stuff like that? If that question okay. is answerable, the fire started on the eighth floor, and. Uh... It went up from there. Mm. So those were the floors, but there were other, uh, you know, factories uh, with uh, workers throughout the building. Um, 
but as Marianne said, we don't know how many triangle factory workers were there, but the fire affected the ninth and 10th floor, but per primarily the ninth floor um, of the building. Of course, the elevators, I mean, you know, the building had to be out of commission in some ways um, after the fire. But the other floors, as far as I know, were not affected. Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, I'll, I'll ditto what Suzanne said. I really, I, I've never ever read or come across anything that talks about the other, um, the other uh, industries in the building and what happened to them. That's a great question. Right. Well, thank you both for for that. We'll we'll all have to do our some of our own research and get get back on that. Um going to call next on if they want to Octavia um asked a few questions regarding um connect uh on Abby's union involvement today and um also historical implications Octavia if you'd like to ask your question you should be able to unmute and do so now Okay, another, um, let me just, uh, yeah, uh, apologies everybody, a little issue with the mic there. Um, let me just ask the question I picked out of there. Then this would go to, uh, this would go to Abby uh, from Octavia. How many CBOs do you work with to inform, organize, and reserve the rights of people who will be vilified in their unionized, unionization efforts or so uh, how do we protect people who are retaliated against against the by the bosses, which I believe had happened in some of the Workers United cases and Starbucks organization drive? Do you have anything to comment on that? Um, yeah, so. You really it's kind of tough because the best thing to do often in those situations is to get together with your coworkers and figure out like a collective action to take because there just aren't a lot of systemic remedies to union busting and the kind of um, physical and psychological abuse that that kind of um, exposes already exploited workers to. Uh, so yeah, I, I, I know that I, so in like in my retaliation um, efforts uh, that at my workplace, I ended up having to file like a whistleblower report at work because it was like, I don't know how to uh, make this uh, stop, which is also why um, I'm advocating for the Workplace Psychological Safety Act, because I, I do think it's unrealistic and unsustainable to ask workers who are already being so mistreated to, um, you know, kind of take, take the lead in that, in that um, fight. Like when, you, when you're not having your basic needs met, it's really tough to ask folks to do that. So that is part of, um, sad, sad, sad to say, there's right now, there's not a lot that we can do other than the things that we're kind of already doing. And um, like Suzanne was saying, talking about these things is pretty huge. So um, hopefully that kind of answers your question. Can I just add something? Um, you, you probably all know this, but if you don't, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but there is a, a pending lawsuit to declare the NLRB declared unconstitutional. Starbucks, Amazon, SpaceX, and Trader Joe's uh, have signed on. So it will continue to be hard. And in fact, if they succeed, will become even harder um, to organize and to protect workers from retaliation. Um, Yeah, thank you. thank you all for answer um for answering that question. Yeah, very very troubling news in the horizon, which is why the great work that everybody here does is so important. Um, I think let me just looking through my questions here. We definitely we just have time, I believe, for one more, and then we'll have to wrap up again. Thank you everybody for coming. Um, 
One of my. Oh, I'll just. I, I believe the person who asked this question has left, but um, I believe this is in regard. It will end on a, a triangle question. Um, this is a question from, from Blanc CP, who was in the, participant, uh, chat earlier, asking if was one of the com one of the company defense lawyers named Stretz. Can we speak? What was the? Uh, and I guess the question. That question be, um, was there any particular notables or particular tactics that the people who were defending Triangle Shirtwaist Factory employed against the the workers? The the, the uh, lawyer was Max Stoyer, mm -hmm. and he was a renowned New York City lawyer, and he was vicious. Um, and what he did uh, was badger the uh, women giving testimony whose English was, you know, uh, far from fluent. And, uh, you know, he really uh, confused them. Uh, and uh, they had a very hard time. He was really shrewd and uh, did not let up until he, you know, you know, made every possible case that uh, the uh, doors could not be determined whether they were locked or not. But he would really attack these poor young immigrants who were making an effort to tell the real story. Yeah, they practiced, right? Because they were uncomfortable with how they might sound. And he used that, that the fact that they had clearly practiced against them and asked them to repeat um, and when they did, and it sounded exactly the same, then repeat. And then if a word or two was changed, he would jump all over that. Um, and, and the jury was, they, they decided that he had demonstrated that Blank and Harris didn't know, or that it wasn't clear beyond the shadow of a doubt. And the jury was probably rigged. I mean, everything, the judge, the lawyers, I mean, there was no justice really in the system. Uh, at that point, Tammany Hall ruled, and it was uh, a, a city of corruption, really. So they probably packed that jury. Oh, uh, thank you, Marianne and Suzanne. And yeah, and of course, things are still stacked against us today. So bringing it back to our struggles today. Um, Great. Thank you, everybody, for attending. Um, we're coming up on time here. It was so, it, it was absolutely great to have. Uh, thank you, all the panelists, for coming. Um, thank you uh, for everybody, all the everybody here to come join us today. Um, great. Um, so again, um, you know, please, you will receive well, tomorrow. You will receive an email from me um, with uh, with uh, an evaluation form to tell us how we did here and what uh, what you'd like to see included in future programming and stuff like that. Uh, I will include links to um, Ewok and the and the Triangle Fire commemoration. And um, yeah, and I think just before you go, since we have everybody here, if you are in New York City, um, Alba is hosting a little, if you're a fan of the history of the Lincoln Brigade, we are hosting a little, a play, a song, a, um, a musical, and uh, recreation of the letters of George and Ruth Watt. George Watt being one of the founders of the veterans of the Abraham Lincoln Brigade, and, and, and you know an important guy in the history of Alba. So if you're in New York City and like to see some song and well not dance but just song, uh, we can please join us. Uh, great. Uh, thank you so much, everybody, for coming, and uh, have a great rest of your day. Thank you for doing the program. Thank you. A joy. Thank you all.